My name is David. I'm the CCCO, meaning that I'm involved in projects both in Louis Paulson for product design and also for brand and communication and our marketing efforts uh, and part of the business development that we are doing on a daily basis here at Louis Paulson. Uh, we call the webinar Design to Shape Light. This is really our, uh, our mission in life for Louis Paulson. This is what this company is all about and has been for uh, almost 150 years. So we go away way back in, uh, in time, especially since 1924, where we've been working with Paul Henningsen that you'll learn a little bit more about before this presentation is over. So this is where I'm sitting. Uh, now it's summertime in Denmark. This is, I think, a winter shot, but this is the exact locations where we are. This is at the uh, Kulegården uh, in Copenhagen. And uh, you see the headquarter and the showroom and retail shop of Louis Paulson. And this is uh, actually uh, the next door uh, building that I'm in uh, as uh, of now, which is about to open very soon as an add-on location to the Louis Paulson uh, headquarter and showroom called the D-Studio. I'll tell you a little bit more about that as a sneak preview because it's not opening up before 20, 30, six hours. Uh, so I'll share a bit about that with you. But this is the beautiful location we are at. So what we are opening up is uh, a brand new uh, premiere, world premiere of D-Studio. D-Studio Copenhagen, the first of its kind uh, in the world. And this will be hosting not only Louis Paulsen, but uh, a series of original heritage brand featuring B&B Italia, Max Alto, Asuchina, Arc Linea, Floss, and Louis Paulsen as the two light brands. Um, and um, as I said, opening up uh, just uh, 36 hours from now. And uh, being a combination of showroom, design destination, design hub, retail for all design lovers uh, in all walks of life. And we're looking very much forward to uh, opening it up also uh, closer to you in the near future. But this will be the first of its kind and looking so much forward to it. At Louis Paulson, our strategy is to continue the heritage and the growth of Louis Paulson internationally um, in, the end, uh, in the market of high-end lighting, uh, building on the strong heritage that we have and also uh, renewing it. We aspire always to exceed expectations in our products and designs. And uh, our aim is to deliver long-lasting design that shapes light for people and spaces. So the shaping of life is really the core essence. And we do envision a world with only good light and are committed to giving people a better quality of life through exceptional lighting. Very short around our strategy. We do that in focusing on continuously developing and improving our product and designs, uh, communicating and transferring to all audiences uh, worldwide in our brand and communication, uh, having sales organizations around the world and also focusing a lot on having operations as part of our growth in the challenging of uh, the logistics bringing our goods uh, around the world. So this is to constantly grow but also being more efficient and uh, improving our execution uh, in a global market. But really what makes the difference in the company is our people and culture uh, we have many, many employees that has been here for decades, both with the craftsmanship of manufacturing lighting, but in really all functions of the company and are spread uh, around the world with, uh, with people uh, in all markets. Also, the support functions of uh, our administration and IT systems and all of this that will tie uh, it all together. And recent years, of course, focusing a lot of digitalization, meaning that we can uh, use not only the physical locations that we are at, but also using uh, the digital possibilities, that especially uh, the last uh, period of time over the last year and a half with the COVID-19 told us to be a very good thing, but also a way of continuing a dialogue with our customers and our um, specifiers uh, in a tough time. Lately, ESG or sustainability has been something that the world has been putting more and more effort into and also in the projects that we are working with. 
we see it as a continuation of what we've been doing always uh, since we've been believing in longevity and quality in our products that will make sure that they last a lifetime or even longer uh, is the most sustainable uh, way of actually looking at ESG. But it has changed our perspective on being <clears throat> even more focused on how we can use it as an active driver also in the way we are considering materials, uh, recycling and also take back solutions that I will share with you in a minute. So really where the company's story started uh, in terms of lighting was together with uh, this man. And no, it's not Alfred Hitchcock, but this is Paul Henningsen. And Paul Henningsen uh, was the founding father of the Danish uh, light philosophy or the way of uh, trying to control the uh, electric light or the artificial light. And the reason why we're using this image is that this is kind of using him as a silhouette or almost as a, a, a shade uh, from the light. And that was his whole mission in life was to control the light and make sure that light was becoming pleasant and directed where it's needed, uh, avoiding that it becomes glary or harsh, uh, but controlling it in, in, in all aspects uh, of the possibilities. So this is uh, the image we like to use of him, using him as a founding father and appreciating all the principle he had around lighting as a guiding uh, design philosophy for us nowadays. Uh, but not resting only on the historic part of the design, but using it also in our new designs. We have a lot of legacy. So everyone you see here on the left side on the screen is our heritage designers, uh, all passed away, but all having huge or enormous influence on architecture and design history. This is Paul Henningsen, it's Ali Jacobson, it's Werner Panson, Wilhelm Lauritsen and Finn Yu. Some of the greatest, uh, the big five, we call them in, in Danish design and all part of designers within lighting of fluid pollution. But also uh, the contemporary designers uh, that we work with uh, every day, uh, a lot of Danes, uh, but also uh, designers from around the world. And really what we see now is not to create Danish design, but creating design that are based on the principle that we believe in uh, for Louis Poulsen and the traditions that are within uh, form follow function and the Danish principles that we are working with here. And as I said, sustainability is becoming increasingly important, not only working with it as a philosophy, but also reporting it and sharing it with the world so that we can uh, set up high targets and uh, make sure that we are following them, not only reporting on uh, all the, uh, the pleasant and great stuff we achieve, but also uh, reporting on the hassles that we have in, in, in doing so, because this is not uh, just an easy job to register and start uh, measuring uh, everything we do. But we started the journey and uh, we have it as a focus of not only being something that we need to report, but something we see as a, a guidelines in, uh, in the way we approach uh, business and the way we approach our uh, designs. One example here is uh, where we launched recently uh, the Pantella, uh, not a new design. It has 50 years anniversary uh, this year. Uh, but the versions uh, of this uh, small fellow is uh, called Pantella Portable because it is a, a battery solution. And the, where we have been working with all kinds of fixtures uh, over the last decade uh, or century, really, uh, battery solution wasn't something that we were very familiar with. So we made mistakes in the beginning. We made um, battery packages that uh, was uh, replaceable, but not re really uh, easy replaceable for the customer. So what we are going back, upgrading the product like this, is to make sure that the second generation of this Pantella Portable is uh, easy replaceable battery packages and all the electronic components can be replaced so that we can uh, extend the, the, the lifespan and the longevity of the products. Another exciting project that we're working with is around the PH5. PH5 is uh, iconic, historic, Heritage designed by Paul Hennings and designed in 1958. Uh, and one of the items, I think from a volume perspective that we actually sell uh, the most of uh, and has since uh, 1958, 
This is a product that you see everywhere in uh, private uh, households, in businesses, dentist offices, lawyers' offices, everywhere in all different kinds of materials and colors and finishes. And often it's also a vintage piece that are being uh, sold on, uh, on, on, uh, on, uh, in vintage stores. But recently we started a take back scheme where we want to say if we, instead of repairing or restoring or repainting, are just uh, striping the product from its uh, original paint, can we introduce it in a raw finish where we are actually spending as little effort as possible in terms of uh, activities that will be um, um, having a larger footprint on the product but continues the still uh, the finishes that it can have uh, an updated lifetime by replacing only electronics and stripping the paint. Uh, it gives a new finish, a new raw uh, impression that could be used in uh, different purposes. So hasn't been launched yet. This is still as a pilot, but will be introduced to the market this, uh, this fall. What we've been doing for many years is that when we, for instance, are working on our post tops, outdoor lighting, that this is uh, fixtures that are uh, being in the, in, 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 the, in the urban landscapes much longer than, uh, than uh, the technology that was initially uh, being designed for it. So we have many of our uh, outdoor fixtures that have been uh, replaced with um, retrofitting maybe not only once, but twice or three times uh, in their lifetime. And this is also part of uh, extending the, uh, the lifetime and lifespan and longevity of the products. Here is the famous icon that was uh, designed in uh, the millennium uh, and is being spread around uh, cities and landscapes uh, all over the world. And now is being updated with new second generation LEDs and retrofitting where um, it can be easily replaced with completely new and less consuming um, uh, light sources uh, to continue the lifespan. So a little bit about design to shape light and our philosophy. Here's a beautiful iconic photo of the artichoke designed also by Paul Henningsen in 1958. This was a great year of design for Paul Henningsen and for Louis Paulsen, maybe the most iconic and famous item in our collection. Uh, 72 leaves of uh, metal, copper, brass, or uh, powder, uh, powder coated uh, paint uh, is covering from the light source here in a beautiful way that makes it almost artistic and distributing the light in the most elegant and uh, art-like way. Uh, is a great example of what we believe is the, uh, the core essence behind design to shape light. The oldest one we have in our collection is the tree shape principle, also of Paul Henningsen. This was designed as early as 1926, can you imagine? And uh, was uh, being introduced shortly after he participated in the World Exhibition in Paris. Um, and still one of our best sellers uh, in the collection in thousands of different versions. But here also you can see uh, the essence of uh, design to shape light that is both how it directs the light downwards, but it's also a translucent feel of the opal shades that is mouth blown glass shades uh, that uh, is softening up the light and gives it uh, a very pleasant atmosphere or ambience in around the room. And ambience is exactly uh, our core value, uh, we define it as our customer promise that you know with any types of fixtures for Louis Paulson that what has been in focus is really attention to the ambience that the light create. So the balance or the duality between the design and the light is really the balance that we're always trying to optimize to create that, get that great ambience of the product. But our heritage, we define as quality, quality in material, quality in craftsmanship and in durability. Because when we aim to have products that will last a lifetime, it's also a matter of having materials that will be beautiful for a lifetime. So even though they age or they patinate, that they do it in a way that where they become increasingly beautiful uh, over time. Passion is the culture of the company. 
Um, everybody in Louis Paulsen has this uh, culture of the company and the ancestors and the founding fathers very deeply in their heart. And uh, it creates very high standards, uh, but also a passion uh, in, in what we see as a true Louis Paulsen product and also in the way we bring it to the market. And finally, the position that we're aiming at, often uh, defined as human-centric or humanizing the space where the light is actually interacting uh, with humans. We defined a long time ago that we wanted to create light for humans and for the spaces that humans uh, is interacting in, in order to create a, a more human-friendly atmosphere or ambience uh, for the people and the spaces that the light is within. This can all be told in a very short, small movie that we made featuring the background and history of Paul Henningsen and Louis Paulsen, and it comes here. Louis Paulsen exists in the energy between dualities, light and dark, form and function, modern and classic, craftsmanship and innovation. In 1924, world-famous Paul Henningsen created the Paris lamp with Louis Paulsen. The lamp was the frontrunner for the groundbreaking three-shade system from 1926 that perfectly determines the distribution of light. How we design and work with light can still be traced back to Paul Henningsen's original ideas and his views on dualities and how design can shape light. Every design starts and ends with light. We always explore how light acts, bends, reflects, and affects. And from these insights, the design takes shape. We design light in a way that appeals to the heart, as well as to the eye. Form must follow function. Every detail in the design must have a purpose. With a tradition of collaborating with the likes of Paul Hinningson, Arne Jakobsen, and Werner Panton, today we continue to work with world-class designers, all of whom have a desire to do what no one else has done. We share a Scandinavian approach to design where simplicity is key and deep contemplation is behind every detail. What they create are centerpieces, but the designs serve a far greater purpose than just decoration. The designs can energize, soothe, welcome and connect. It is scientifically proven that light affects how we feel. Light can be designed in detail to create an atmosphere where people can live, work and interact both pleasing during the day and night. In the dark, you can create paths, emphasize architecture, and transform outdoor areas. It's a discipline of its own that we practice and refine. We share a genuine passion for design and light, and we share an uncompromising approach to quality and craftsmanship. Our approach to beautiful design is simple. Our purpose is to create an attractive ambience that affects people and spaces. Louis Paulson, Design to Shape Light. Hope you enjoyed the video. Um, a bit of an example on some of these values illustrated by the artichoke. Here you see up close the leaves. This is a copper version, and you see that each of these leaves have been brushed by hand and bent by hand. Uh, in order to make exactly their place in the design of the artichoke. And uh, what's interesting is that we start to hear more and more requests on not only the complete new and brand perfect uh, artichokes, but also for artichokes that is having a bit of uh, vintage feel to them, exactly because they do patinate or age uh, with beauty. So actually there's some request of pre-patinating already from the beginning, uh, the material of the copper. So this is giving us exciting new uh, ways of uh, treating the metals and uh, looking into these kind of designs as well. Interesting with the artichoke and with the designs like this is that as soon as they fulfill the original purpose, uh, um, often the best of them is equally relevant both in the B2B markets and in the B2C markets. And that's exactly what's happening with, with the artichoke here in a B2B reference, but also in, the, in uh, private residences. Uh, it's uh, uh, very relevant and originally designed 
uh, hospitality in the restaurant of Lange Linie Pavilion when it opened in 1958. So this was a, a B2B product design uh, in its intent, but is equally now in, in B2C uh, and B2B uh, contexts. So the master himself, I mentioned before, or many times now, the year of 1958, and that was really where he designed both the PH5 and the artichoke and also the snowball. So this was a unique year for him, but really he was so productive, not only within lighting design, but as a, um, a drama writer, he was writing uh, ironic uh, plays and songs and literature and books and reviews uh, during his whole lifetime. And he was really a, um, a cultural person in, in all aspects of life, but he was uh, in his approach to light both being an artist and a scientist at the same time, where it was both scientific measures on how the light would distribute from this shades that he made, but it was also very much uh, how it would affect the emotional parts of the well-being of uh, humans. For instance, an example, which is quite interesting nowadays, where we are using LEDs as the main light source for many of his uh, fixtures is that now we can manipulate a little bit with the color spectra of the LEDs, uh, which was not possible in the days where the design was originated. But uh, to control or manipulate a little bit of, uh, of the color, especially the rose color, he was, would be painting the insides of some of the shades so that it would give a, a more pleasant uh, impression of the people that was viewed in the light. And this is exactly the same uh, rose tone that is now ma manipulated in a lot of the hospitality LEDs that are used uh, nowadays. Uh, exactly the same philosophy, the same knowledge that PH uh, Paul Henningsen found out a um, uh, hundred years ago, uh, but that is now being used in modern technology and making his light and design just as relevant as they were back then. So this was a lot of the historical past. So of course, uh, we're working with new designers and uh, trying to find new ways of working on the same principle, but in complete new design languages. One of the best examples is working with Eugen Slato, uh, a Danish Norwegian designer that created the Patera in 2015. This is what you see being uh, crafted here. This is Eugen. Uh, and working on his first prototype of trying to see how can you make new mathematical laws on creating shapes around the light source that actually will allow a full distribution of light, make sure that the whole fixture is lit by the light source, and at the same time making it completely glare free so that you will not have any look into the direct light source uh, at the same time. Uh, inspired by the principle of Paul Henningsen, but interpreted in a complete new and different way than Paul Henningsen did it, uh, and ending up with this beautiful uh, masterpiece of Patera, where New Versus is being actually launched uh, for the first time since 2015 uh, this year. Based on the Fibonacci curve and the, um, and the principle of uh, this uh, mathematics found in nature is actually uh, just uh, or just uh, copying the same spiral uh, that by nature is at the same time not designed for it, but ending up in a solution that will uh, give few uh, complete and full distribution of light without letting uh, uh, the site uh, go inside to the light source of the design. This is the new. Uh, version that we're launching this season for the first time, not being a spheric design, but an oval design that is extending the family and also looking natural and beautiful in, the, in this design construction. Another and completely different example of same philosophy was done uh, in 2019. Last time we were able to go to a fair in Milan we presented this beautiful design by Olufu Eliasson. Mm -hmm. And Olufu Eliasson is not a, a designer by heart, but an artist and also working uh, different ways uh, with his art, normally only making one-off uh, unique art pieces, but agreed with us to try and make what could be a combination of his artistic approach, but into a commercial uh, lighting fixture as well. Ending up in this beautiful uh, OE quasi light, 
that you see here. Olufur is fascinated by light and uh, probably uh, the one person that, that I know of that most uh, know the most about light and uh, Constant uh, is using it in his art and, and challenging ways of, of, of using it. And combined with the way of uh, an approach of Louis Paulson, uh, we ended up making a, a brilliant example of a combination of unique um, artistic design language and a, a beautiful uh, light fixture itself. Olufur has been fascinated with this uh, platonic solids uh, and used it both in his arts and being fascinated uh, from his younger days and, and wanted to use uh, the two platonic solids, the two last one here on the slide called the dodecahedron and the icosahedron, uh, and trying to make them interact in a unique way with each other and using that for the design language. Um, you can feel it here to see that on the outer side using uh, the icosahedron and uh, on the inner side the dodecahedron. And what's so unique about it is that actually, and I think it takes an artist's mind to, to make this twist, but he was flipping the philosophy of Paul Henningsen in some ways uh, inside out in the way that it's actually the outer shape where it in, in the joint of the outer shape of the icosahedron is actually having the light sources that is then projected into the reflector on the inside, which is the dodecahedron, and the uh, the joints of the outer shape is meeting uh, the base of the inner shape, and therefore having a unique reflector that is then projected out again. So soon I will show you a, a small video, and you can feel that when you are actually experiencing the lamp or the pendant life, and you go around it. It changes constantly expression and you are a little bit doubtful what is the shade and what is the light source and where is the light source coming from so here you will have a 3d tour into the pendant and try and see if you can experience what i'm talking about The work with Olufu and also working with the, the OE Kwasi uh, also give inspiration on the ESG or the sustainability way of working. It was uh, a call to Olufu Eliasson that uh, we would be working with uh, sustainable materials. So the uh, aluminum uh, frame on the outer shape is completely from recycled and recyclable aluminum so that it can be detached and, 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 and recycled and also that we're using aluminum that has already been recycled so no virgin materials uh, into this one. I showed you the artichoke by Paul Henningsen uh, earlier on. This is another masterpiece from Paul Henningsen. It's called the Septima. Septima was really a front runner for uh, the artichoke and you see some of the same thoughts or design principles that uh, Paul Henningsen was seeking here only using uh, glass shades, but in order to make it uh, glare free and have the reflections uh, stronger downwards, parts of the each of the shape is being brushed so that it's uh, uh, half of it is uh, transparent and let the light completely through. And the other half is uh, in a, a brushed, almost uh, milky uh, texture so that uh, it will, prohibit that the glare gets uh, into the eyes of uh, whoever uh, watches it. This is a, a masterpiece that was so difficult to make in the time of Paul Henningsen that it has been out of the market for so many years uh, until we re-engineered it last year and have just brought it into the market again, completely original to the, to the design and shapes of it, but in a complete new uh, reconstruction or re-engineered uh, way of uh, making sure that when you assemble it and when you replace the light sources, you can do it without actually harming uh, the pendant. 
uh, and also upgrading with LEDs uh, um, the light source and experience at the same time. A few photos of the same beautiful location. This is the Darling, uh, a small one-room hotel in Copenhagen, uh, which is a really a, a hidden gem where uh, we were uh, able to place a lot of our iconic um, uh, light fixtures. Uh, different in age, we have the tree shape principles from uh, Paul Henningsen in the window and on the floor, uh, designed originally back in 1926. We have the Pantella floor lamp by Werner Panson, designed in 1971. And we have the beautiful ring crown in the, in the ceiling from the from the 30s uh, by Wilhelm Lauers. And then we have Ali Jacobson unique floor lamp at the end next to the couch, uh, also designed uh, for the Sass Royale in the 1958. So this is part of our heritage collection uh, together with beautiful Danish uh, design furniture as well. But what I want you to look at now is uh, in, in this uh, apartment or hotel room, what happens when each of the fixtures get lit? Because what we believe in is that, of course, nowadays you can make just a, a lit ceiling or you can have uh, light fixtures that can efficiently uh, make the function of the light, but not making it pleasant. So what we believe is it was we call uh, islands of light, where the more light sources you lit up, you get actually the play between or the duality between the light and the darkness. And this is where the drama begins. This is where you see the shadows. This is where your attention is pointed to special places uh, in, in the space. Uh, and even though that it's daylight outside, I think that you can see what I mean when I'm just lighting one light fixture at the time. That it's not only a matter of adding more light to the space, it's also a matter of discovering what happens in this area where the light is being turned on? And just as important, what is happening in the areas where there's no light? Because that is what's really important about the light philosophy and decorating with light is allowing light where it's needed, but only where it's needed and allowing also uh, for the dark. We're seeking constantly to see how can we improve uh, lighting fixtures in a way where they can uh, support health and well-being, uh, both in, uh, in residential and private homes, but also in institutions and in schools, education, workplaces, everywhere, really where light is being used. Example here in the school environment where we were working on uh, with schools on having uh, tunable white or Kelvin adjustable where we can actually control the lighting so that it follows the circadian rhythm uh, of the sun, uh, because it's been uh, shown in research time and again, that the more you can actually make sure that even uh, in the winter time, that you follow a path of circadian rhythm and uh, having a brighter light early in the morning when you're meeting into school, the more alert, the more efficient uh, and ready for learning you will be. But this is not a light that you can stay in for eight hours. You need to actually tone it down maybe during the day towards lunch and maybe uh, having a brighter and higher Kelvin temperature after lunchtime again. And then for a few hours, and then by the end of the day, you start having warmer Kelvin temperatures as well uh, and making sure also that you continue this rhythm when being at home. We know it from our phones that we shouldn't have too bright and too high Kelvin temperatures on the phone close to our uh, bedtime and that you leave screens and artificial light uh, before you go to bed. So all of this is uh, studies that we do in order to enhance the functionality of these uh, fixtures, uh, both in the more architectural lighting, but also in the decorative lighting in order to make people more aware of what is it in the light that makes you comfortable and give the right ambience in the spaces that you are surrounding yourself with. Because we don't have a huge portfolio of design items. We have a small uh, portfolio across architectural lighting, outdoor lighting, and then a large portfolio of decorative lighting. 
But what ties it all together is that the principle and the philosophy of Design to Shape Light, the principle of having fixtures that completely lit themselves, direct light in the right uh, areas, create the right ambience, and are glare-free is the same, no matter where um, we are, um, are placing them. So we're trying to cover the whole journey of human being in the morning, waking up at home, uh, traveling to work, being outdoor, being indoor, uh, having visits to cultural institutions or in restaurants and hospitality, where everywhere design uh, and light matters, this is where we want to be, close to human and, uh, and uh, where they thrive. A more extreme example on studying how light affects human beings is the study that we did together with Saga, uh, Arch uh, space architects um, in this experiment, where we just played a small uh, but important role. This is just a small teaser. Uh, I let it speak for itself and just say a few words about it afterwards. Humans are evolved to live on Earth with natural sunlight. The sky is ever present, and, and we wanted to, to, to create the same thing in our habitat. Once the sun set for good, the habitat becomes your entire world. And imagine a world where the sun doesn't rise and set. We tried in a way to create the most realistic moon mission possible. So what this story is really about is that this brilliant two um, scientists and architects are preparing a habitat that would be suitable in space on the moon and they're testing it out on a north arctic possible place in, uh, location uh, on greenland and they're spending two months uh, inside this habitat completely blocked out from any daylight any sun uh, light and uh, just having the habitat fitted with a light panel that would change over time and give them some kind of circadian rhythm of natural daylight, but in an artificial space. And with them, they brought this small uh, Pantella portable uh, where they would use it almost as they said, as a candlelight, giving a little bit of uh, sense of the warm, cozy light, or as we in Denmark say, uh, adding a bit of hygge. And uh, really in these extreme conditions found out um, both emotionally, but also most physically on their body, how important it would be to have the right kind of light uh, for such a long period of time and being connected to uh, the natural daylight and to the sun, even though being in an artificial habitat under extreme conditions. The full movie can be seen on our social uh, media. I think you'll find it uh, easiest on, on LinkedIn. Uh, where there's a short movie about the whole experiment and the process of uh, going in space with this habitat. What also we study, of course, is uh, uh, urban outdoor areas on creating light. Uh, there's a, a, a trend or a mega trend in uh, all cities, all urban uh, developments where everybody, all architects and lighting designers is becoming more and more aware the effect that light will do in making this uh, urban outdoor area pleasant uh, and how they can make sure that people will be comfortable and safe in these urban areas uh, during the day as well as during the night. Um, and uh, we made a small movie that I'll show you a teaser for on that subject. We believe that there's a link between the quality of light and the quality of life. Nature is where we find the meaning and the answers and the processes in nature is what inspires us. And we try to create spaces where people want to go. The light has endless opportunities to enhance and improve the urban life. What you saw here at the end was uh, architect from SLS uh, working on uh, urban outdoor spaces and creating this uh, outdoor spaces between the buildings and in the natural um, uh, urban outdoor areas in the cities.
And examples on very different kind of histories, the, right, the, the post top on the right is uh, Human Park, just designed uh, two years ago uh, for this urban outdoor areas. Very efficient lighting using the LED boards, but making sure that using LED boards in a way where we take away uh, um, the glare by having um, the rounded uh, spaces uh, around the LED board. An example on the left is uh, Albert Sloan, designed in the 60s, that are on almost all apartment buildings in Copenhagen, everywhere. Uh, very low technology. It was just with uh, 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 incandescent light bulb originally, now also with the retrofit of LEDs, but with the same principle, just making sure that the ring uh, is allowing for no glare and pointing the, uh, the light exactly where it's needed above the doors. Other example that comes from our decorative indoor collection with the Arne Jacobson, you remember the floor light from the, uh, from the, the Darling Hotel, but also the tree shade principle from Paul Henningsen here used as a garden bollard um, in hospitality and in, in, in private gardens. And then recently working with Christian Flint on what was originally just a bollard, the principle of this is to slide, take a knife and cut it through a stick uh, to open up for uh, the lighting. Uh, you see it on the on the right hand side, the, uh, the garden bollard. It was a, a more urban bollard in the beginning, but now also for hospitality and gardens. And uh, just introduced six months ago, it has a plaza version where we have the same elegant discrete designs, but allowing for a spot solution on, the, on, uh, on squares and city centers, but in a very delicate way that again controls the light, making it pleasant and also the design uh, fitting into both the architecture and the urban landscape in a very discreet way. So this is one of the latest newcomers in our outdoor uh, B2B collection. I hope you uh, appreciated uh, some of the content and uh, please feel free to ask any questions. Great, thank you, David, so much for that beautiful presentation. Students, we're gonna turn over to audience Q&A. We've had a lot of questions come in, so we're definitely gonna try and get through as many as we can uh, with our remaining time. First one that we have, for designers who are interested in learning more about health and lighting, what resources or organizations would you recommend? Oh, I don't know all of them. I know, uh, I mean, what has really been inspiring for us is working with, with uh, uh, with Saga Architects on this Luna project. This is something that we would never have uh, dared to look into space design and lighting, but having a, uh, a project that would be so space-like uh, uh, possible and, and uh, having the, the results uh, from a two-month survey of being in artificial light is giving us a, a huge uh, input. We've also been working with um, a startup company in Copenhagen called uh, uh, Luz um, that are trying to actually, with a small light button attached to your uh, shirt, being able to register what kind of artificial and natural daylight are you exposed to every day and how is it affecting your sleep and your energy level uh, in an app which is uh, really interesting to see because uh, where and how can the hypotheses that we've been working with and believing in be documented also by new technologies such as a light button and, uh, and, and, and apps. So this is, uh, they're called loose technologies. Loose in Danish is light. And then they're called loose technologies. Uh, they have, what I find really interesting, a very human and, um, and straightforward approach to seeing light as um, something for our well-being and health in the same way as we do exercise, eat, uh, healthy eating uh, and drinking, um, and being more aware on how we should uh, look at light as an important factor, factor of our well-being. Absolutely, that's fascinating. What are the differences between the design process of a lamp for the B2B market and one for the B2C market? Good question. Good question. And uh, something we uh, constantly discuss uh, because uh, what we found out is actually, and I think that's probably unique for Louis Paulson, but 50% of everything 
we sell uh, to the B2B market on the indoor is decorative lighting. So exact same lighting that is being used in residential uh, households as well, because I think there's a trend, but there's also, uh, uh, or maybe it's just a very long trend, but uh, we all know in hospitality that, that going to a bar, going to a cafe, going to a restaurant, really what we need there is comfortable, pleasant, uh, ambient lighting as we do at home. And to create that kind of uh, same homey atmosphere, lighting and uh, light fixtures plays a, a, a huge part. So that's maybe obvious that, that, that it is like that. But even in offices and in institutions and in, in schools and kindergarten, there has been made studies that shown that, for instance, adding on pendants instead of just having ceiling lights is lowering the, the, uh, uh, the decibel volume level of kids because it unites all of a sudden, uh, instead of having open spaces where shouting can be allowed, pendants and small islands of light is allowing for more uh, lower voices and a different way of behavior. So there's a lot of interesting studies that explain why uh, decorative lighting in, uh, in B2C markets is also relevant. But other than that, of course, uh, often there are more regulations more uh, demands on efficiency on lighting um, and soon becoming or already becoming more and more uh, demands and requirements on controls that will fit into uh, individual lighting zones so that you can change the uh, the light temperature or the Kelvin temperatures of the light depending on the kind of works that you're doing. That's great, thank you. How do you see people's relationship with lighting change after the events of this past year? You know, one example is so many people are now spending much more time outdoors. Uh, are you seeing this impact the lighting industry? Yeah, maybe, but uh, I think the first uh, reaction we saw was that people got very focused on their households because they spend so much time indoor. And they were framed within their four walls or uh, the houses. So what we could read from our sales figures were that there was a huge interest in redecorating and uh, and changing your home offices and maybe your home uh, your home home because you spent so much time in it that you all of a sudden became aware. But I think especially by working from home, you found out that your chairs were comfortable, that your your tables were too high, too low, and the lighting. Uh, in the in the home offices or home environment were wrong. So, uh, but also I think that it's in the interest of uh, all of us now, but also of um, municipalities and landscape architects to create outdoor areas where we are kind of like being attracted to or to spend more time in the outdoors as well. So that we can see now, actually our, where our B2B project sales for the indoor uh, had a small decline in, in the period of the COVID, uh, it never happened to the outdoor. So maybe that was a reaction to uh, being aware of also of making this uh, comfortable, pleasant uh, outdoor spaces. One student has written in that they are a huge fan of the Amber limited edition pH lamps. How does Louis Poulsen look back at past catalogs to determine what limited edition pieces to produce any clues for the 2021 PH limited edition? And I guess going even further than this question, how does Lee Paulson look at its archives to reintroduce older pieces? Of course, we treasure it very high and we respect it very much in terms of, <clears throat> um, of the, the huge legacy uh, and, and heritage we have with, with many of the designers, but Paul Henningsen in particular. So we, we've been introducing a, a limited series uh, every year for quite some time where we are, are, are digging into the archives and they are almost endless with Paul Henningsen, which makes it so interesting and, and fascinating. And there's a huge collector crowd out there that are, are waiting for that uh, new limited edition to, to be launched. We do it respectfully. We are trying to maybe find versions that have a bit more um iconic uh, or heritage elements to it that is maybe also allowing it to be um, slightly vintage like um, 
uh, but at the same time being um, original as they were back then, using same kinds of materials, a lot of the same kind of colors, uh, often only updating really the functionality and the, and, and the light sources as being improved. But for instance, uh, getting back to the amber glass was uh, a, a huge process in terms of, of finding the right way of making mouth blown amber glasses in the right tones. So we've been continuing uh, that for a while. And uh, any hints on, on the, uh, the version for 2021, I can only say uh, it's my personal favorite until now. Uh, it's a, a, a very iconic and unique piece that the collectors will know from the past, but haven't seen for several decades in the market. Perfect. Well, we can't wait to see it. Are there any products uh, already made of recycled material? Sorry, I, I need to have that again. Sorry. Any products made from recycled material? Uh, not 100 percent, but uh, you can say that uh, in, in many, many cases, uh, we try where we can not to use virgin materials, whether it's being in aluminum or metal or in plastic. Um, and that's kind of like the, what the whole industry is, is, uh, is going through at the moment. And I think we can make it different on, on, on single elements. But what we're doing is, is a huge pushback to the, to the industry and the suppliers in each categories to use recycled uh, materials and, um, uh, and elements in the design. Mainly what we focus on is the longevity, not virgin materials and uh, spare parts and replaceable uh, electronic components so that instead of, uh, um, of it being the end of uh, a product life cycle when uh, a shade or an element is broken, it can be replaced. Uh, that's our focus at the moment. Great. How does the reclamation program work? The reclamation, so the in terms of what do you mean by reclamation? I think it was something that you had mentioned earlier. Oh, the reclaiming, yes. The take back, is that it? Yes, I think so. Yes. Well, it's early days. I think that uh, we're looking at it uh, uh, two ways. Uh, one way is uh, um, being very much aware of uh, the scrap that comes in our own production and uh, along the, the, uh, the supply chain, where parts are not being remelted, but re being reused. So it's kind of upcycling uh, the material, especially with the PS5 example that I gave. Um, and at the same time, combining it with the take back. So we are looking at what, how we should, uh, I mean, <laughs> in Denmark, we have uh, a very strong uh, recyclable uh, in all of our aluminum uh, bottles and glass bottles that is uh, organized in every supermarket and, and everywhere where we're giving a, quite a high price on bottles to make sure that it goes into the same uh, re recyclable uh, uh, take back system. And, and we know that we cannot as a, a sole pro uh, manufacturer do that by ourselves, but with this special product, we, we are aiming to have a, a take back system where we are, are, are making the value of the product equal to um, the sell value of a, a perfect um, vintage product in the same category. And then we are trying to make different raw finishes where it actually will be, even though it's 10, 15, 20 years old, by re-scrapping and giving it this new raw finishes and updating the electronics, it will have just as long as lifetime as it already had existed. So using only maybe 10% of the resources of manufacturing a, a, a new uh, pendant, it will have a reintroduction to the market, uh, giving a, a high reward for whoever uh, delivers it back and also have a production cost that can be sold uh, within the same uh, sales price as uh, an original uh, new version. Great, thank you for that explanation. We are just about out of time. Students, I apologize if we didn't get to your question, but we do have one final question. Any last words of advice or wisdom for the students tuning in today? Any final last advice? 
well, <clears throat> be original. Great. Well said. David, talk. Thank you so much. We really appreciated you taking the time to come on and share all this about Louis Poulsen with the students. My pleasure. Thank you.